Good morrow, friends. This is Jordan, and you're listening to Not Strictly History. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another episode of Not Strictly History. Now, I was not going to talk about this ever, actually. Um, And um, there's actually no reason to talk about it. It's actually a non-issue that I've created in my brain because none of you have said anything about this. Again, a non-issue I've created in my brain. Um, I've noticed, listening back to some of my episodes, that the audio, every once in a while, gets a little iffy. Now, if you listened to the Dirty Dancing episode, that audio did have a hard time, and it's because I only have one microphone, and Josie and I were doing our best to share it. I'm sorry about that, but a lot of you have said you loved that episode, which is great, because I also loved that episode. So, but when I'm just recording by myself, I need you to know that one of the reasons that every now and again the audio gets a little off is because I get really worked up and passionate and I like to use my hands a lot and like move, I'm like almost moving around a lot really. And um, I try to like hold my microphone like really close to my mouth when I do this, but it's, especially if I get really into it, it's hard to do that. So that's usually what happens. Again, I'm in the process of fixing all this. I have um, some new microphones coming. Hopefully that will help. Again, this is probably a non-issue because None of you have said anything, but um, I've created a problem with it in my brain and therefore decided to address it. Thank you. Um, Once again, good day, everyone. I was going to say good morning, um, but it's actually like 2.30 in the afternoon right now. And also, who knows what time you're listening to this. So, really, I just hope that you're all having a good day. If you are, that's great. Keep up those vibes. If you aren't, Well, my friend, you've come to the right place. And I don't know that I'd normally be that confident about my own work, but today's episode is even more special than every episode that I say is special, which is every episode. Today is even more special than all the specialness. So I'm going to confidently say that what we're, today's episode ought to cure any ailment you're currently suffering from, okay? Now, this level of confidence being established, it also becomes necessary for me to confide in all of you that I'm actually really, really nervous about this episode. I mean, I'm wildly excited. Truthfully, this is probably the most excited I've been about an episode since the Macklemore episode in season one, which is saying a lot because I've been stoked for a lot of our episodes pretty much every week. And I was really stoked for that episode. If, you'll re- if you've been listening regularly, you'll remember that I was qu- quite unhinged in that episode. However, it is very true. I am so, so excited about this episode that I can't really explain it. But since that's the reason you're here, I'm going to try to explain it. Today's topic is a very broad one. And as such... There will also be some narrowing down of the topic in order to exactly illustrate what we're here to learn about. The broad overall topic that we are here to learn about is Old English. And in order to better illustrate what Old English is and was, we will also be talking about what is perhaps the most famous text written in Old English, which is Beowulf. Now don't worry, because I will be explaining all of this further. But for right now, I need to explain just a little bit why this episode is particularly special and why I'm rather nervous to be here. Here is why. Today, everyone, friends, family, acquaintances, strangers, today, everybody, you are in my house. And this is what I mean by that. Obviously, I'm a historian. I have a few degrees to prove it. That's why we're here every week. So when we come together to talk about history, I'm usually really in my element, doing my thing, having a great time. However, it is important to note that every historian has a specific field, an area of expertise, if you will. And today, we are diving into my area, Anglo-Saxon England. So simply put, Today, we aren't just talking about history the way we usually do. Today, you are coming with me 
to the inner sanctum of my entire operation. We are journeying together to the area of history upon which I have stamped my name. Today, I am not just sharing history with you. I am guiding you through one of my deepest passions, hence our slightly unnecessary subtitle. This is both what makes this episode particularly special and much more than usually nerve-wracking. Okay, I'm really excited to finally share this piece of myself and my life and my education with you. Like, really, I, I truly am. But I'm also nervous because, as you can probably imagine, um, historians specializing in Anglo-Saxon England aren't the largest group of people in the world. Um, but that's okay because we actually belong to a much larger group known as medievalists. And let me tell you guys, that group is lit, okay? I don't know what profession you're in, but you need to quit and go back and get three degrees to be a medievalist, okay? I'm serious. <laughs> um, being a medievalist is awesome. I'm madly proud to be a medievalist, but I digress. This is all of this, okay? It's just my really flowery way of saying that I'm really excited to be able to dive into a passion with you guys today, but I'm also out of my brain nervous because I'm low-key expecting all of you to waste away with boredom and like set your phone on fire or something. Obviously, I've written this episode in such a way that I hope we can avoid that, but I guess if you're bored and out of your mind, so be it. It happens. You may simply exit out and wait for the next episode, which is going to be a good one, by the way. Anyway, friends, more than any other day, you are in my house today. Really, you're in my court, okay? Now, please excuse me while I do some warm-up stretches and slam a protein shake, because things are about to get real. Today, I'm going to start off by talking to you about one word. Now, I'm not talking to you about this word because it has anything to do with our episode necessarily. It doesn't. I'm using this word to prove a point, and that will make sense in just a minute. This word that I want to talk to you about is the word believe, as in I believe in you or I can't believe this. The word believe is one that we use all the time in a variety of contexts, but what if I told you that this word, as we know it, as we pronounce it, as we spell it, has really only been around for roughly 500 years? Well, you might be asking how that's even possible, and what did they say before then? And I have those answers for you, as I generally try to do. The word believes, believe, excuse me, comes from a long, long time ago. Today, it has several definitions, but originally it meant one thing to have faith or confidence in. Back then, this word was not the B-E-L-I-E-V-E -E -E that you know and love today. Back then, the word was belief in, or depending on where you lived in the English-speaking world, it could also be Gelifa, Gelifa, or Gelifen. It was not until the mid-1200s that people started using this term to also apply to the act of being persuaded of a truth. And it wasn't until the early 1300s that the definition, the definition to accept as true was applied to this word. It is also around 300 that we see the word being used in reference to something that you think or your opinion. And at this time, the spelling was B-E-L-E-E-V-E. -E -E. Now, if you can even call spelling common back then, which you really can't. I mean, let's be honest, that was crazy. But it wasn't until the 1600s that we get the spelling we know today. And it wasn't until the late 1800s that the phrase, believe it or not, was born. Crazy, right? This is a very, very small example and excruciatingly brief explanation of how words can change over time, of how languages naturally grow and evolve. So remember just a few minutes ago when I said all those really weird, weird words that believe used to be? Well, everyone, those words are from the language called Old English. And it is the language that all English speakers today owe their communication to. I want to dispel once and for all the horrific, heretical idea 
that Old English consists of words like thou and thee. I don't know how to tell you how irrationally angry this makes me. Every time I hear people say, oh, you know, Old English, like thou and thee, the Anglo-Saxon historian in me goes absolutely feral and screams, what? Which wasn't a great way of, uh, that's one of the terms that Old English used for exclaiming. It wasn't a great pronunciation, but anyway. Um, so listen carefully. Okay, everybody, listen very carefully to me because I'm about to drop a truth bomb. And after I drop this truth bomb upon you and you are recovered, I want you to go tell every single person that you know, okay? Old English was very, pretty much a separate language from our own. What the entire uneducated world thinks of as Old English, the, thou, etc., is actually early modern English, the English spoken by people like our friend William Shakespeare. So I repeat, that is not Old English. You are in my house now, and you will follow the rules, everybody. And the rule is, we do not disrespect the truth about our linguistic heritage, or there will be consequences, okay? Anyway, so let's talk about Old English in a very calm and rational manner, okay? Old English is the language that modern English originated from. In other words, it is the earliest form of the English language. It is also known as Anglo-Saxon in some circles because it was spoken by the Anglo-Saxons or English-speaking peoples who inhabited Britain. It was spoken from about 450 to 1150. And fun fact, many modern languages today from all over the world can trace their roots back to Old English. It's true. So here is the very brief history lesson associated with all of this. Once the Romans left Britain, the only people left were the native Celts. And I'm sure that they probably would have preferred it that way, but alas, it was not to be. In the 5th century, so the 400s, three Germanic tribes made their way across the North Sea and decided that England was a pretty stellar place and that they'd like to live there now. Same. These tribes were the Jutes, the Saxons, and the Angles. Now, this influx of Germanic people was a lot more gradual than I'm making it sound, and it happened over several generations. However, as you can probably imagine, there was no love lost between the native Celts and these new tribes. The Celtic inhabitants very much resisted the newcomers. In fact, the legends and folklore of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table are generally dated to this time generally, suggesting that these native Britons were searching for a hero of some kind, which is wild. I mean, makes sense, but anyway, that's a story for another time. The Celtic inhabitants of Britain at this time obviously spoke various dialects of their native Celtic language, but when these Germanic tribes arrived, the Celts were driven from the whole of Britain into modern-day Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, and some even went to the Brittany region of France. This, of course, changed a lot of things for the Celtic people, but particularly their language. It only survives today in the Gallic languages of Scotland and Ireland, the Welsh of Wales, and the Breton language of Brittany, which are all modern variations, obviously. Now, fun fact, the last native speaker of the Cornish language died in 1777, and the last native speaker of Manx, a Celtic language spoken only on the tiny Isle of Man, died as recently as the 1960s, making these now dead languages. There's something about a dead language that just breaks my heart. It's crazy, but anyway, so the tribe of Angles were very warlike, and so they ended up becoming the most dominant people in England. But all of our tribes were still there and represented, and soon enough, seven small kingdoms formed in England, making up what is known as the Heptarchy. The Saxons were in Essex, Wessex, Wessex, and Sussex. The Angles were in East Anglia, Mercia, and Northumbria. And the Jutes were in Kent. The word England or English originates from the Old English word Ingla land, which literally translates to the land of the Angles. And speakers of Old English often refer to their language as Inglisk. Now, Listen, because I'm about to tell you something 
so, 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 so important. Okay. Old English is a Germanic language. Let me say it again for the people in the back. Old English is a Germanic language. And what do you suppose that means? It means that English is a Germanic language. So the next time that somebody tries to tell you that English is Latin-based or a Romance language or any of the crap that I have been told, you have my full permission to point at them and laugh because, um, no, it's not. Now, the reason that many people think this is because of the French influence that we have in our language, and this influence is, of, is because of something called the Norman Conquest, when French William the Conqueror conquered England in 1066 and ruined everyone's language patterns, thus making French have an impact on our language. And this is what evolved Old English into Middle English, which we will have to discuss another time. So just please remember that even though we have some influences from other languages, our fundamental language is a Germanic language. I can't even tell you in, in words just the trouble that I have had trying to convince people of this until I get so frustrated I nearly shove my diploma down their throat. Not that I'm aggressive about this in my passion or anything, because that would be weird. Um, but anyway, so Old English is a Germanic language, and it does share some fundamental similarities with modern German as such. However, since it is the mother of modern English, the language is actually much closer to our own than you would think at first glance or in really hearing it spoken for the first time. The truth is that around 85% of Old English is no longer in use today, but the elements that do survive form the basis of the modern English that we speak every single day. To be more specific, even though pronunciation and spelling has definitely changed, the 100 most commonly used words in modern English are all of Anglo-Saxon origin. I would put the sunglasses emoji right here if I was typing, but I'm not. Fun fact, many of our modern swear words are also Anglo-Saxon, and those that aren't generally come from medieval speech patterns. And I cannot stress enough how much sense all of that makes and how much I love it. Anyway, the handful of French terms that we still use are most often ones that actually harmonize well in sound and in form with English language patterns meaning that we may have adopted terms from other languages, but really only so far as they were easily incorporated with our own, which is so important to remember. We can therefore say that for English speakers, learning Old English would be a little bit easier than learning an entirely new foreign language, such as Spanish or French. And while that may sound like absolute hogwash, I can give you my personal guarantee that this is quite true. Now. I need to be honest about something. I am not fluent in Old English because I'm not sure you can really apply the term fluent to a dead language necessarily, but I do remember seeing it written for the first time and thinking that it looked like just a bunch of ridiculous made up words. Once I started to study it a little bit more, I started to find that it was actually quite familiar. It's really not as bad as you think it is, I promise. Now, I don't know why this is important for you to know, but this is the third time that I have tried to record this next section of this episode. Um, I just want to get it right. And I was about, you know what? That doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, let's begin. So I've been going on and on about this language so far and explaining all of this background, but I, I, I kind of get it. You probably want to talk more about just the language itself, which we're going to do. I did mention this a little bit earlier, but um, I'm going to bring it up again for just a second. Old English is a dead language, meaning that it is no longer spoken in everyday use, even though people can speak it and read it. It's not spoken natively by anybody. Another very important fact about Old English is that a very large portion of the vocabulary centers on the glorification of warfare, which, if you think about all the people that came together to form this language, that totally checks out. Now. Remember the heptarchy that I told you about? Thank you. 
that is the seven smaller kingdoms that the Anglo-Saxon peoples formed in England, and each of these areas spoke their own dialect of Old English. But remember, a dialect doesn't necessarily mean a ton of changes, so obviously they're all still speaking the same language. These four dialects of Old English that were spoken were Northumbrian, Mercian, Kentish, and West Saxon. And most of the writing that still exists today in Old English is in the West Saxon dialect, meaning that it formed the basis for literary standards once Old English began to be regularly used in writing, and it's often referred to as the common dialect. Now, we need to very quickly establish a sort of timeline for Old English so that you can get a sense of what we're doing here. According to Albert Baugh, I think that's how you pronounce it. He's an Old English expert from the University of Pennsylvania. You can divide Old English into three phases. The first is primitive, and this is from the 5th to the 7th centuries. There is no literature or documentation of Old English at this time, really, because there was no literacy. It was definitely being spoken. I mean, it was the language, but as far as writing goes, we only have a few examples of it being tried to be written down in Anglo-Saxon runes. Early Old English is from the 7th century to the 10th century, and this contains the earliest documented evidence of the English language. The language was flourishing at this time in the literary sense. It was finally be being used in writing, which is just, we're going to get into that. It's so exciting. And late Old English is the 10th and 11th centuries. This, of course, is the final phase of Old English before the Norman Conquest and the evolution towards Middle English. Now, Originally, I was going to try to have a section in this episode about speaking the language and then a section about reading the language, but I've decided to combine them for a couple of different reasons. Because in my personal opinion and experience, Old English is actually a lot easier to speak once you have the visual of the words. That's just how it has been in my experience. Another reason that I was going to separate them was because literacy was very, very low when Old English was first being spoken. So it existed for quite a while before it started to be written down regularly, but all of that's okay. We're gonna blend these two sections together and we will be fine. Please feel free to get out a notebook in this next sec next section of this episode because it's kind of heavy in information. But we're going to begin by talking about some of the letters that existed in Old English that do not exist in Modern English, and there are five. The first one that we're going to talk about is called a thorn, and the thorn makes the TH sound. And this looks a lot like the letter P, but the circle-y part is more in the middle of the line, if that makes any sense. The next letter is an ETH. This is also the TH sound, and it kind of looks like a D with a slash through the top of the line. Now, the thorn and the ev are, of course, both TH sounds. They were used interchangeably to represent voiced and unvoiced TH sounds. Now, fun fact, today when you see shops like Ye Old Pub or something like this, this comes from Old English. This comes from the fact that the word the was spelled thorn e. And when printing presses first became, were starting to become a thing, the thorn still existed. And um, the letters for the printing press were imported from other places in Europe and they did not have a letter for the thorn. And for whatever reason, a lot of people who were printing thought that the thorn looked like a Y. So they just substituted it for a Y making ye old instead of the old. There you go. Fun fact. The third letter that we're going to talk about is called an ash, and it is the letters A and E just smushed together, really, and you've probably seen that. Out of all of these, it's probably the one that will look the most familiar to you. And the ash is pronounced a ah, as in cat or bat. The fourth letter we're going to talk about is called a yog, and it looks pretty much exactly like a lowercase cursive Z. I mean, there's a little bit of a difference, but it looks a lot like that. And the yog made the Y sound or the G sound, depending on the word it was found in. The final letter is called a win, and it looks almost exactly like a regular P. And it made the W sound. Now, interestingly enough, the yog and the win 
are usually replaced by either Y, G, or W in modern translations, while the thorn, the ev, and the ash are usually left in place. I guess it's just easier that way. Anyway, that's that's usually the thing. So you're not going to see a yoga and a win very often. So truly, if you think about it, we've really complicated our spelling since the good old days of Old English because we no longer, for example, have a single letter telling us to make the TH sound and specifically how to use it in the word. Now we just have to do our best with nothing but two letters and what's left of our determination. I mean, thanks, French language, I guess. But anyway, let's continue. I want to go over some more of the overall facts that you need to know about the mother tongue. Old English, in contrast to modern English, has three genders. It has masculine, feminine, and neuter, and a much greater proportion of irregular verbs than modern English. And many verbs that were strong verbs or irregular verbs in Old English are weak verbs or regular verbs in modern English. Interesting, right? The letters J and Q did not exist in Old English. So as far as spelling goes, J was often like used with a form, it kind of looks like the letter I. And the sound of Q was spelled with a CW. Which brings us to the next fact. The letter C always makes the hard K sound. If the letter F, as in Frank Sinatra, is found in the middle of a word, it makes the V sound. But if it's at the beginning or the end of the word, it still makes the F sound. Now the letter S, as in Sinatra. Oh my gosh, you guys, I did not even plan that. This is so cool. The letter S, as in Sinatra, is the same as the letter F um, in that if the, if the S is at the beginning and end of the word, it makes the usual S sound. And if it's in the middle of the word, it makes a Z sound. Now, the combination of S and C is pronounced like R-S-H. The combination of a C-G is pronounced like the DG in edge, so a J sound, kind of. Now, important, this is very important. The combination of CH, as in cheese, is not a digraph in Old English, like it is in Modern English. And so when you see a CH in a word, these letters have to be pronounced separately. I'm going to give you an example. There is an Old English name that was very, very common, and it is pronounced Quickhelm but it is, I'll tell you how it's spelled. C-W-I-C-H-E-L-M. And when the modern English reader looks at this, they want to say quichelm. However, again, because C-H is not a digraph, we have to pronounce the C and H separately, meaning that this name is actually pronounced quichelm. And it can be a little tricky because when you first see it, obviously that's how you want to say it, but just remember, just remember that. And these last few facts have been about spelling, and we need to dive just a little bit deeper into the spelling portion of the lesson. Now, modern English. Okay, there are about, let me see if I can get this, this number correct. There are about 82.5 billion spelling traditions from everywhere possible that have come together in modern English to create utter chaos. Hence the phenomenon of the spelling test. What was that? Anyway, but in our mother tongue, in Old English, spelling is generally really, really straightforward. Every single letter in the word is pronounced, except the digraphs, the letters that are supposed to be together, like our SH. Old English digraphs, some examples of those are SC and CG. Remember how those are pronounced like SH and J? Remember? There are several consonant clusters in Old English that appear at the beginnings of words. And when you first see them, they can definitely look a little strange because we're not super used to this sort of thing at the beginning of a word. But once you hear them spoken, it actually adds something so magical to your world. And really, that's something that I want you to remember. I'm, I'm telling you all these things. But I'm not actually here to give you lessons on how to speak or read Old English. Not in this episode. I mean, maybe that'll come someday. But here, I'm really just here to provide you with some basic information and kind of just to help you get a feel uh, for things. Um, but at least one time in this episode, I will read a passage of Old English to you. 
And I feel like all of these things that I'm telling you just provide some valuable context so that you can know these things before you hear it. And if you were to ever see it, maybe it would help you read it. I don't know. Also, it's just wildly fascinating, and I dare you to say otherwise. Okay, nothing? Thank you. Okay, so back to the consonant clusters at the beginning of words. I'm going to give you some examples. One of these is C-N, and of course, this is a consonant cluster, not a digraph. So this is pronounced like K-N, which brings us to one of my favorite words in Old English, which is knicht. And that means boy or knight, as in a knight in shining armor. It is spelled C-N-I-H-T and pronounced knicht. Thank you. The next one is F-N, again pronounced like F plus N. So there's a word that is fnast, which is blast or wind. G-N is in, such as in the word gnorian, to mourn or wail. H-N is a very interesting one because it's, I mean, how do you pronounce an H and an N really? This is a soft breath before a nasally consonant. The word for nut is spelled H-N-U-T-U, -U, and you would pronounce it hnutu. W-L is W plus L, so we have the word wlank for proud. W-R, of course, W-R, we have wurian to cover. Thank you for all sticking with me. We also need to talk about vowels, people, as long as we're here. Okay, short and long vowels. The letter A, the short one is a, uh, as in bud. Long is a, uh, as in bard. Bar, uh, bar, yeah, just go with me. Then we have our ash. Now this is an added vowel here, because remember we have the ash. This is again, as in bad, or, now this isn't, okay, this is really important actually. Ash is a vowel, and the short and long versions of this vowel sound a lot similar, but they're not. Come with me on this. The short vowel sound for ash as, is as in bad. The long vowel sound is, is as in has. Do you see just the slight difference in the stress on the vowel? If you don't, I'm sorry, I don't know how to help you. E is, is, is as in bed or bade, I as in bid or bead, O as in body or board, and U as in bull or booed. And in spelling, a long vowel is indicated by the presence of a macron or a line over the vowel. Let's talk about diphthongs. I love talking language, clearly. I'm like geeking out so hard over here. I don't know if any of you are still with me, but I love the word diphthong. It sounds a little inappropriate, but it's just an awesome linguistic term. Come with me on this. Diphthongs are vowels which glide from one to another without a break. For example, the word I as in I or I as in the thing you see out of. Okay, say this word because, you know, they're pronounced the same. Say it very slowly and see if you can catch how there are actually two vowel sounds in this word that mesh together. That is a diphthong. And modern English uses a lot of diphthongs from Old English. Okay, so... We've talked a tiny bit about pronunciation and spelling. I know it probably didn't feel like a tiny bit, but trust me, it was a tiny bit. Now we need to talk a little bit about writing, the actual act of writing down these words, which brings us to paleography, the study of ancient writing and manuscripts, which is basically 90% of my master's degree. I am telling you guys, the things that my brain can do because it has been trained to read old documents, it's just like, chef's kiss okay it's truly truly incredible i'm trying to think of a movie or something what am i thinking of oh okay did you guys see that movie like forever ago with bradley cooper i think it was called limitless or something where he takes those pills that like 
help him use all of his brain and he gets really smart or whatever. Like a second after he takes the pills, all of a sudden he's using all of his brain and he can like see everything and like everything's coming together and it's like super cool. Okay, it's not like that at all, but it's a little bit like that where like as soon as I see like this old document, all of a sudden my brain just starts doing these things where it can decipher it because I just spent forever being trained on it. And it's wild. Like bad handwriting from literally anybody is not a problem at all. Because if I can read an old English manuscript from like a thousand years ago, I can pretty much read anything. And I think that that's, that's the real, like that's the real win of all, honestly. But anyway, let's get back to the writing that exists in old English. Like I explained before, literacy wasn't a huge thing at the beginning of the Old English period, and this resulted in a couple of things. First, poetry existed a long time before prose, because poetry was something that was performed. Now, in our day, we think of poetry as this poem you read in a book or something, but back then, poetry wasn't written down, it was performed, and it was passed down orally. These stories were ones that you told the people that you lived and worked with at night around a fire, there was usually music to go along with the poem. And it was, it was done by a performer who specialized in these things. So poetry existed a long time before written words, because it was just such a different thing than we think of poetry as today. Also, the actual writing styles that were used to write down Old English also went through quite a bit of an evolution. Originally, if Old English was ever attempted to be written down, it was carved using the alphabet that the Anglo-Saxon people knew, which was the runic alphabet. Think wood and stone, right? They're trying to carve this on wood or stone and in their ruins, and this alphabet had between 26 and 33 letters. Later, during our middle period, when Old English began to be written down and used as a written language, Christian missionaries had already made a big impact in England, and they had introduced the Latin alphabet that's very similar to what we use today. What's important about this alphabet is that it, it the appearance of it is just a lot more rounded, and thus it's more suited to being written down on parchment or vellum. It's not this alphabet with sharp angles, like is easier to carve. We're writing it down and therefore it's, it's just frillier, swoopier, swirlier. There are some synonyms for you. So anyway, it makes sense that once people started writing Old English down, they would want to use letters that were easier to write. This shift really started around the 8th century, so the 700s. There came actually there actually came a time when runes were really only used by the antiquarians and historians of the day, which is very intriguing. So if you'll think back a little bit to our old English timeline, it was in the 7th century that writing really started to pick up when it came to old English. So this is the 600s. This is when we get the very first literary works in old English. Because remember, poetry arose first because it began with a cultural thing that you could pass down orally. Well, it's because of this that poetry is considered the heart of Old English literature because it had existed for so long before and then it was finally able to be written down. So this is very important. Poetry is very important to Old English literature. Here's a very, very crucial fact, my friends. We only have about 400 surviving manuscripts written in Old English, which works out to be a total of about 3 million words. And before you think that this sounds like a lot, let's compare it to some of the great writers that we know. Charles Dickens, for example, all of his works combined are over 4 million words. So the fact of the matter is that we really don't have a lot of data from this period to, of linguistic history. And even though this language was spoken for roughly 600 years, and it was used in writing for more than half that time, we just don't have a lot of information. But we do have enough to allow us to make a confident description of the linguistic character of Old English and to plot its evolution to Middle English. Again, we'll discuss Middle English another time, but that development is mostly characterized by some vocabulary and grammar. The very first known written English sentence. This is crazy, guys. The very first known written sentence in English is an inscription on a gold medallion 
found in Suffolk, England. And it dates from about 450 to 480. So long time before Old English is like really being used to write things down. The inscription reads, This she-wolf is a reward to my kinsmen. I would love to give you more information on this and on the medallion, but I don't really think we have it. I just need you to know that if you're a native English speaker, the very first written sentence in your language is, this she-wolf is a reward to my kinsmen. And I want you to carry that legacy with you for the rest of your life. And again, remember, this would have been in runes, which is even better. So let's talk some more about Old English literature. So we're in the 6-700s right now. Okay, runes are being switched out for the rounded Latin alphabet. And this is when the very first English poet comes walking into town. And his name is Cadmon. And he is from Northumbria. Now think about this for just a minute. He is the first English poet. His work, Cadmon's Hymn, is considered the oldest surviving text of Old English literature. And it was composed between 658 and 680. So not only is Old English finally being used to write with, but it is also being used as more than just a language you write things in, if that makes any sense. We are getting creative, okay? And we also, at this time, need to take a minute to talk about a source called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. My dudes, my buddies, my pals, this source is so important. I cannot stress this enough. Please, 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 please understand this. I can, this source is so, so important. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is a lot of things, but one of those things is that it is the longest text that we have written in Old English. Not only that, it recounts the history of England from the time of Caesar's invasion until 1154. Listen, there is not an early English medievalist alive who does not owe their life to this source. And not only that, it was written in Old English. Heart, eyes, forever. Okay, my copy of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle Actually, I'm pretty sure that I have two. I think I have one here at home and one at my office at work. It's never far away, okay? It's oddly comforting to have it close by. Not only that, I studied the crap out of that thing for my MA dissertation, but that's neither here nor there. It's really, really, really important. I am shaking my fist and my hand a lot. It's really important, okay? Okay, thank you. Another Old English manuscript definitely worth mentioning is what is known as the Old English Hexateuch. This is a very, very richly illustrated and beautifully made Old English translation of the first six books of the Bible. And this was probably compiled in Canterbury about 1025 to 1050. So having this in mind, I need you to do something for me. I need you to pause and really think about what I have just told you. Try your very hardest to think like a scholar for just a moment. Think about what having a source like the Old English Hexateuch implies. There is one conclusion that I really need you to come to, but if you didn't, that's okay. I'll tell you what it is. The fact that Old English began to be used in writing not only for normal things or for things like poetry, but for things like the Bible is actually a really, really, really big deal. Because let's talk about vernacular languages for just a minute, okay? A vernacular language is the language that people speak in a specific country or region. In other words, whatever language is your first language, the one that you grew up speaking is your vernacular language. So obviously, at this time in England, the vernacular language was Old English. But literacy was still very low and people who could read and write were mostly monks or the wealthy and they were really only trained to write in latin because the very act of being able to read and write was heavily associated with the church at this time who did everything in latin 
So yes, people had their vernacular languages, but they weren't really writing in those languages. It just wasn't a thing. So the fact that we have any sources written in Old English is a really big deal. And this obviously opened up the way for people to just start writing in the language that they also spoke regularly. So how did this happen? How did Old English move from just being the language of the people to a language that you could write things in and very important things in for that matter? Well, the answer to that question, my friends, is the one, the only, the legendary King Alfred the Great. And yes, I will most definitely be doing a separate episode all about King Alfred one day because that man was incredible and I am a huge fan. But for today, we're going to quickly cover some of the basics because he is very important to this story. Okay, thank you. King Alfred was king of Wessex or the West Saxons from 871 to 886. He was then king of all the Anglo-Saxons from 886 to his death in 899. Because yes, this icon of a man basically united the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Many people actually consider King Alfred the first king of a united Britain. And of course, we'll have to get to all of that some other time. But for our purposes today, the main thing that you need to know about King Alfred is that he was the kind of king who not only cared about his people, not he cared about their well-being, but also about their growth and their advancement. King Alfred believed firmly that his people needed to be educated in their native language, not Latin. And my friends, this was absolutely unheard of. People did not simply go learn in their vernacular language. It was not a thing. If you went to go learn, you went to be tutored by a monk, probably, and you learned in Latin. That's just the way that it was. But King Alfred, the freaking great, decided that the people needed to be learning and reading and writing in their own language. He decided that it was very, very important. And if you look a little further into Alfred's life, which of course we'll get into another time, it really, this passion that he had really makes sense. Like I mentioned before, he united the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and he did this against the invading Vikings. He spent a very good portion of his kingship saving his people from Viking invaders and Vikings overtaking them in general. So it makes sense that he was really passionate about his people and about preserving their way of life. So, not only did King Alfred decide that it was super important for his people to be educated in their own language, but he took a lot of very unheard of steps to make sure that this happened. For example, he personally did several translations of important works from Latin into English. King Alfred is truly, he's honestly revered by many, many today as having pretty much single-handedly saved the English language from destruction. By the time of his death in 899, he had raised the prestige and scope of the English language to such a high level that it was arguably superior to any other vernacular in Europe at the time. I don't even know how to sing praises big enough for this, okay? The fact of the matter is, we owe a huge, huge debt of gratitude to King Alfred the Great because his encouragement and support of the vernacular language did a lot of things. Obviously, it made English a pretty big deal at the time. But also, Alfred's reign is when we see this first great period of literary activity in England. That is what made it even more important. Like, when you realize that this literature was being written in the native language, I truly do not know how to express to you how important that is. Once people started writing things down in their own language... This is when we start getting creative works as well as more ordinary works. So not only is prose being written down in English, it's finally becoming a thing, but all of that poetry that had been performed and passed down orally for generations and generations was finally being recorded in the way that people had been hearing it for centuries. Which brings us to the second phase in our episode today, and one of the most important literary works of all time. Yes, that is right, my friends. It is finally time 
to talk about Beowulf. If I had it my way, all of you would already know everything that I know about Beowulf. And in this part of the episode, I would just go feral fangirling. But I realize that this is not the case. So I'm going to do my very best to rein myself in and not just blubber. For now, I can blubber later, but for the moment, I will be professional and teach you the ways. So let's let's do that. Okay. So a lot of you have probably, you probably know of Beowulf or have at least heard the name Beowulf, but I'll give the basics of it just to build the narrative. Okay. Beowulf is a heroic narrative, more than 3,000 lines long, concerning the deeds of a Scandinavian prince named Beowulf. And it is it absolutely stands as one of the foundational works of English poetry and English literature in general. Now, the story of how we found this story and the manuscript that houses it is a very big deal, so we are going to be talking about that. But for now, I want to give you a brief summary of the work. In the beginning of the poem, we hear about King Hrothgar and his men in Denmark. Hrothgar is a wonderful king whose hall is known for generosity and merriment, but all this joy has angered a nearby monster, Fair, who begins to terrorize the Danes for 12 years by coming into Hrothgar's hall every single night, carrying off a bunch of his warriors and eating them. Again, this goes on for 12 years, and the people are very genuinely suffering. Our hero, Beowulf, hears about these troubles, and he travels to Denmark to help get rid of this monster. Now, King Hrothgar is a little surprised at this unknown hero offering to help, but he does accept Beowulf's help. There is feasting and celebrating to just commemorate this, and then that evening, the king goes off to bed, and he leaves Beowulf in charge of his men and the hall. In the dead of the night, the monster, Grendel, comes to the hall. He rips off the huge, heavy doors, and he eats one of the men that Beowulf had brought with him. Grendel then begins to fight Beowulf, who is, by the way, massively strong, and also refuses to use a weapon against the monster. Of course, why not? He gets a hold of Grendel's arm, and he holds on so tightly that Grendel can only get free of him by ripping off his own arm. He then retreats from the hall and goes back to his swamp, trailing massive amounts of blood everywhere, and then he dies in his swamp, probably of blood loss. And Beowulf then proceeds to put Grendel's arm on display for all of the people to see. Now, the next day is one of great rejo rejoicing, as you can probably imagine, and a feast is thrown in Beowulf's honor. However, as the warriors sleep that night, Grendel's mother, another swamp monster, comes to avenge her son's death. And in order to do this, she kills one of Hrothgar's men. The next morning, Beowulf dives into her swampy lake to search for her, and she attacks him. At the bottom of the lake, Grendel's mother lives in this kind of scientifically impossible, weird I'm sure it's possible in some way. I'm not a scientist. Grendel's mother lives in a dry cave at the bottom of this lake. And this is where Beowulf fights her and finally kills her with a sword. He also finds the corpse of Grendel in the cave. And he cuts off Grendel's head to take back to Hrothgar. The Danes rejoice again. Hrothgar makes a farewell speech for Beowulf talking about the character of a true hero. And he also bestows Beowulf with honors and princely gifts. And then Beowulf returns home to the court of King Hygelac in of the Geats. The second part of the poem passes pretty quickly over the death of King Hygelac in a battle, which is actually historically true, and the death of Hygelac's son. Beowulf succeeds them as King of the Geats, and he reigns peacefully as king for 50 years. However, this peaceful reign ends when Beowulf is an old man and a fire-breathing dragon becomes enraged when a man steals from his horde. The dragon then begins ravaging Beowulf's kingdom and the ever-incredible Beowulf decides to fight this dragon, even though he knows he will probably die because he's gotten old. So he starts fighting this dragon and this fight is very, very long and very, very terrible. 
which is a very stark contrast to the battles that he engaged in when he was young and much stronger. The battles with Grendel and Grendel's mother didn't last long. He was an incredible warrior. He was strong. He just, I mean, he just took care of it. It's not the same anymore because he's become an old man. And it's it's made known in the poem that it's, that it's quite sad. So during this fight, not only all that, but during this fight, he is also deserted by all of his men except for one young kinsman named Wiglaf, who does come to his aid. Eventually, they kill the, the venomous dragon together. However, Beowulf is mortally wounded from a bite in his neck. Before Beowulf dies, he names Wiglaf his successor. After his death, he is cremated on a funeral pyre, and his remains are buried in a barrow that's built beside the sea. The people then mourn the death of this wonderful warrior and their beloved king, and they also express their fear that without Beowulf, they might be invaded by nearby tribes. And there you have a fairly decent summary of the story, Beowulf. Now, to say that Beowulf is my favorite thing of all time isn't the wildest claim I've ever made. I remember hearing about it when I was really, really little and my older siblings were in high school. I remember them having to read it um, for class and talking about it briefly. But all I knew from, that com from hearing that conversation was that it was really old, that it was a story that was really old. My next interaction with Beowulf didn't come until college, actually, when I was taking the best class known to man medieval British literature taught by the one and only Professor Darren Merrill. Shout out to you, sir. You're incredible. Anyway, now, I could definitely do an entire episode. I'm always saying this. I could always do an entire episode on that, but I could, okay? I could do an entire episode on just how amazing that class was, but I'm not going to. That's not why we're here. I'm going to summarize. Learning about Beowulf and Anglo-Saxon society in that class was absolutely life-altering. This class, combined with a class that I took a little bit later on the 100 Years War, cemented my future as a medievalist. But Beowulf and the history of Anglo-Saxon England just really got under my skin. I'm, I'm just not sure how to describe it any better than that. I remember saying afterwards to ask my professor extra questions. I remember sitting in my apartment at night and just pouring over the Beowulf story and spreading papers all over the floor, teaching myself old English pronunciations. It really did truly change my life in every way. And so to this day, and probably forever, unless something truly insane happens, Beowulf is my favorite book. Now, just so we're clear, okay, there are about 10 billion and five different editions and translations of Beowulf, and every single one of them has merit because Beowulf's incredible. But the one that I prefer is by Irish scholar Seamus Haney. And I love it because it has the modern English side by side with the old English. And there is no better way to look at the differences and similarities in the languages than that. Beowulf is my comfort book. When times get hard, I keep it close by or I'll pull it out and read it. Truly. My mom actually, I've a handful of times I've just pulled it out and read it to her on hard days. And um, she always makes me read it in Old English, which is good because I get rusty, but it always makes her cry to hear it in Old English. And it, it honestly makes me emotional too, because that's the way that it was meant to be heard. Which brings us to something that we haven't talked about yet, and we'll just touch on very lightly, accents. Accents are, of course, really important in any language. And when I learned how to pronounce Old English and speak it and all of that, I was taught a very specific accent by my professor. I have since heard it spoken in various accents, but for the most part, I think the accent that I was taught is mostly correct, which is good because I'm really not here for having to change that. It happened already. But anyway, now that you know the story of Beowulf, as well as my own connection to it, which granted was slightly unnecessary, we're going to keep deep diving into it because it is just... It is just so important when it comes to the Old English language. This literally cannot be stressed enough, okay? But before we do that, I'm going to make good on um, a little promise that I made to speak some Old English for you. I was planning on only doing it at the end, um, but since I just shared that little tidbit about how hearing it and speaking it and all of that makes me kind of emotional, 
I'll do it now um, and probably again at the end. So without further ado, here are the first lines of Beowulf in Old English. What? Weir gardena in gierdegum, ther cuninga thrym gefrunon, hu da athalingas elen fremedon, oft skilled scaffing, skedena threatum, monegum magthum, meda setla oftia, exoda ealas, sithen arest weather, fiaskift funden, hidas frofra gebad, we ox on the wolknum, we othmindum tha. Otha tim al quicker, thara imbistendra, over hrondrada hidden scolder, gomben gilden, that was God cuning. So I hope you understand just a little bit better what I mean when all these, when it comes to Old English how beautiful it is, and how good it feels just to listen to it and engage with it. And I'm aware that since this is such a passion for me that maybe it's different for you, but I'm hoping that you at least had some fun listening to that. If this is your first time hearing Old English, then it probably sounded like a completely foreign language to you, and that's completely fine. That makes sense. But if you listen carefully, there are several words that you either know or that do sound familiar. So I obviously encourage each one of you to get your own copy of Beowulf and read it because it's beautiful in every single way. But again, my favorite edition is the one by Seamus Heaney, so I highly recommend that one. And besides the fact that you can see the Old English and Modern English side by side, I just think that he does a really great job in his translation. And as if it could get any better, he wrote an absolutely beautiful introduction to the work. And it is just, it's really, really important to realize that Beowulf is an epic story that comes from a lot of different places. It's about a Scandinavian prince, and it mentions Danes and Geats, but it was written in Old English by English scholars. The culture in Beowulf is really important. The idea of the warrior society, of fighting and or dying nobly, it's all in there. There is a very distinctly Germanic culture in Beowulf, and it has been claimed by several different countries because of that. But here's the thing. We only have one copy of Beowulf. Just one. Without this one manuscript, we would have never known about Beowulf. Beowulf and his story are not mentioned in any other surviving sources, but because it is from Anglo-Saxon England and written in Old English, I think it's incredibly fair to say that anybody who is a native English speaker can claim this story as part of their heritage. And if you're like me, a person whose DNA is strictly Scottish, a tiny bit of English and Scandinavian, then you can really claim this story as your heritage. But claiming this story has always been a really big deal, and I will touch on that a little bit more later. But I bring it up right now because Seamus Haney talks about this a little bit in the beautiful introduction to his translation of Beowulf. He talks about growing up in Ireland and the little phrases that his aunts would use that come from the ancient Irish language. He then expresses this absolutely beautiful sentiment that language is not some kind of self-enclosed family possession. Just, it's not just something that you use betwixt yourself and those closest to you, something that helps you communicate. Language is also an historical heritage. He tells the story of a word he, used, he was used to hearing around the farmyard that he later discovered in a written source and how this word had essentially been lost. And he said that this realization was like, was quote, like a rapier point of consciousness, pricking me with an awareness of language loss and cultural dispossession. He talks about wanting to work out for himself, quote, concerning my own linguistic and literary origins. And um, this is because he was finally understanding that if you take the time to look, you will realize that there are a lot of questions when it comes to the relationship between nationality, language, history, and literary tradition. And then he says the most beautiful thing of all. Once he realized more about what his linguistic history and heritage were, he figured something else out. He began to, quote, 
consider Beowulf to be part of my voice right, end quote. And we need to talk a little bit about what this means because it is beautiful and so important. He began to consider Beowulf to be part of his voice right. What is a voice right? Well, you know, I think it's a lot of different things, but I think in this con- in this context, he's coming to realize that Beowulf as a story, um, the culture that it talks about, the people that are in it are part of his linguistic heritage and his linguistic history. And because of that, Beowulf is part of his own language. It's part of who he is in a lot of ways, but especially linguistically. And I hope that that makes sense because it is very, very powerful stuff to be, to encounter old sources like this and realize that it is a part of basically your birthright is really what he's, he's talking about here. It's a part of your inheritance as a person from wherever you came from. And he also points out that because English has changed so much over the centuries, Beowulf is really only read in translation and mandatory in schools and universities. And because of that, there's a lot of aversion to it in a lot of ways, which is very, very tragic. And he illustrates this by bringing up an absolutely brilliant example. Think of the stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey, these classic epics, okay? Even if you were new to these stories, you have still heard of Troy and Helen, of Penelope and a Cyclops, because this particular heritage has just been thoroughly branded into cultural memory. The words and stories from these particular epics are therefore much more familiar to us than the very first epic of our own native world and native language, which is Beowulf, even though it was composed centuries after the Iliad and the Odyssey. Take a moment to think about that, please, because it is very, very powerful stuff. Seamus Heaney then goes on to explain that this poem is set in a pagan Germanic society governed by a heroic code of honor, one where the attainment of a name for warrior prowess among the living overwhelms any concern about the afterlife. He said, quote, The poem is about encountering the monstrous, defeating it, and then having to live on in the exhausted aftermath. Which is so, such a beautiful way to put it. For me, that might be what I love most about Beowulf, honestly. Haney goes on to say that though this poem was written down in England, obviously the events it describes are set in Scandinavia, in a sort of once upon a time that is partly historical. Which is important to note, a lot of the characters in Beowulf were real historical figures. And as I mentioned when we were going through the summary, for example, the death of King Hygelac in battle, he was a real man and that was a real event. Now, clearly, I'm of the opinion that Seamus Heaney says many wonderful and deeply important things in this introduction. But I think that my favorite thing he talks about is what it is like to read and experience Beowulf for the first time. He says that readers experience a kind of, quote, shock of the new. He talks about how this poem possesses a kind of mythic potency, how it arrives from the beyond and it goes back to the beyond once its purpose is fulfilled. He points out how the opening and closing scenes have the power to retain a haunting presence in the mind. And I think that I love this so much because that is exactly what I experienced when I was first introduced to Beowulf and to Old English. There is something about all of it that, like I said earlier, really got under my skin and has not left yet. There is something haunting and beautiful that just felt like I could reach out and touch it if I just try hard enough. Something that somehow felt deeply familiar even though I was new to the entire scene. Now, the spiritual part of me wholeheartedly believes that this is because I was interacting with my linguistic and cultural heritage. It was a very spiritual experience and all and still continues to be, honestly. I'm trying really hard to explain the how and the why, but the truth is that finding Beowulf then and interacting with it today is always just... Honestly, 
an indescribable experience for me. And again, very spiritual in many ways. And if you are a native English speaker, or even if you aren't, honestly, because this poem is just phenomenal regardless, I hope you understand that this poem, these words, and these messages are also a part of your voice, right? Because they are. All right, so earlier in this episode, I promised you that we were not just going to talk about Beowulf, the story itself, but we were also going to talk about the Beowulf manuscript because it is incredibly important and that story is absolutely wild. Well, the time has come. As I mentioned earlier, we only have one, that's right, one extant or existing copy of Beowulf, and it is contained in a work known as the Noel Codex. For those of you who don't know, a codex is the term for an ancient manuscript that has since been bound into book form. The Noel Codex is named after the 16th century scholar Lawrence Noel. This man was a very renowned scholar who was hired in the year 1563 to be a tutor to Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. At the time, Edward de Vere was the ward of one William Cecil, the first Baron of Berkeley. We are fairly certain that William Cecil gave the codex to Lawrence Knoll while he was working there. But before Lawrence Knoll, we really don't have any clue where this manuscript came from or who owned it or what its life was like. Nothing. The Knoll Codex itself contains a few different works, actually, not just our beloved Beowulf. The first work is a fragment of the life of St. Christopher, The next is called Wonders of the East. It is a description of various far-off lands and their fantastic inhabitants. There is also the Letter of Alexander to Aristotle, Beowulf, which is the bulk of the volume, and finally Judith, which is a poetic retelling of the Book of Judith, which is a book in the Eastern Orthodox Bible, but one that Protestants largely regard as apocryphal. Now, interestingly enough, There has been a vast amount of scholarship on why all of these things are bound together, because back in the heyday of all of these manuscripts, it wasn't really a thing to just, honestly, it wasn't really a thing to bind things together, but definitely not together willy-nilly. So it's a big, like, it's kind of a big deal. Like, why are all of these together? There is a pretty widespread theory that they are all collected together together because they either feature monsters or monstrous behavior. And while I appreciate the attempt to explain one of the great mysteries of the Noel Codex, I just don't really buy it. It seems a little weak. It seems a little foggy. It seems a little murky. I'm not here for it, but that's okay. Let's get back to the manuscript itself. Now, we are pretty sure that the Beowulf manuscript was written between 975 and 1025 AD. Even though this is the date of the manuscript, scholars generally agree that the poem itself was first composed around the year 700. And the manuscript itself is assumed to be a copy of a copy, suggesting importance, use, and demand. Also, it's it's very unadorned, okay? The manuscript is not gilded or decorated in any way, which points to there being a very practical use for it, such as being used to perform. The manuscript that we have today was transcribed from a different copy by two different scribes. One of these scribes wrote from the beginning of the, ma- of, of the poem all the way to line 1939 before breaking off mid-sentence. And do you want to know why? Well, I do too, because we don't know. This man wrote He wrote down 1,939 lines of Beowulf and broke off mid-sentence. Did he die? What happened? I have questions. There are no answers. Welcome to the field, everybody. So, scribe number one. He made a point to carefully regularize the spelling of the original document into the common West Saxon. And he did this by removing any features that had become old and unused or that were too heavy in another dialect. Scribe number two obviously wrote down the rest of the work. There is a very noticeable handwriting difference after the mid-sentence break-off in line 1939. 
And he also seems to have written much more energetically and with less interest. In other words, he was really not as careful, okay? Consequently, scribe number two's script retains more of the older dialectic features, meaning, I mean, it's clearly not professional on his part, okay? He didn't do any of the correcting that scribe number one had already done. However, this has allowed modern scholars to assign the poem a cultural context, which is important, okay? Both scholars, excuse me, both scribes appear to have proofread their work, but it still contains quite a few errors, which is understandable, very common for the time. Scribe number two is ultimately considered to be the more conservative copyist as he did not modify the spelling of the text as he wrote it or anything like that. He simply copied down whatever he saw in front of him. I don't know why I'm like slightly turned off by this. Maybe because scribe number one was trying so hard and scribe number two was like, no, I don't know, but that's just the way it is. So as we talked about a few moments ago, the way that the Noel Codex is currently bound, Beowulf is followed by an old English poem called Judith. This poem was also written down by scribe number two. Clearly, it's the same handwriting. And the wormholes that are found in the last leaves of Beowulf are actually absent in the Judith poem, suggesting that at one point, Beowulf was the last work in the volume. Also, the rubbed appearance of some of the leaves suggests that for a time, the manuscript stood on a shelf unbound, as was the case with many old English manuscripts, unfortunately. So our knowledge, okay, this is, an, this is an interesting little tidbit. Listen, our knowledge of books held at the library of Malmesbury Abbey, as well as the identification of certain words particular to the local dialect that are found in the text, have led some scholars to suggest that the transcription may have taken place there at Malmesbury Abbey. To be honest, I need to look more into this I cannot officially put, I mean, add my own scholarly stamp to this claim. However, I would love for it to be true. I'm totally here for all of those facts checking out because as you have clearly seen, there is still so much that we don't know about this manuscript and about the poem in general, honestly. So I would love it. I would just really get a kick if we could solve some of the mysteries. I think that would be neat. The traditional view is that Beowulf was composed for the purposes of performance, like I said, chanted by a shop, a performing poet, minstrel, or troubadour, if you will, to the accompaniment of strings. The whole thing that some modern scholars suggest is that perhaps it originated as a piece of written literature bor borrowed from oral tradition which is kind of the same thing. So I'm actually irritated by this whole thing. And we actually don't have time to get into all of that. So let's get back on track. So where did the Beowulf manuscript come from? And how and why do we have it? Well, we've already touched on Lawrence Knoll, who came into possession of the Knoll Codex around 1563. But this is actually a big deal in a lot of ways. Well, it's actually not a big deal. It's a big deal to us now, but at the time it wasn't a big deal because it's not like the entire world knows that he has the manuscript at this time. It's just something that he happens to acquire from his boss. The world at large has absolutely no clue that this codex exists. And this doesn't happen until much later, until the year 1705. By this time, the Noel Codex had made its way into the private collection of a politician, scholar, and antiquarian named Sir Robert Cotton, who we are going to talk about a little bit later. But for now, just remember that he's the one who has the Codex at this time. In 1705, a man by the name of Humphrey Wanley was in the library of Sir Robert Cotton, cataloging all of the manuscripts that were housed there. And this is really the first time that the Noel Codex is known, quote unquote, if that, if that makes any sense. So but it would actually be yet another 100 years before the Noel Codex and thus Beowulf actually meant something to anybody before Beowulf became, quote, the touchstone of old English literature. So since we know that the present manuscript was created around the year 1000, scholars have commented a lot on how the manuscript actually lived in, quote, complete obscurity, if not anonymity, for 700 years think about it. The poem was transcribed for the first time in 1789. 
And some of the verses were translated um, into modern English in 1805. But this complete obscurity that scholars have talked about didn't really disappear until 1815. And this is when the very first publication of the first edition of Beowulf was released. And this was done by Icelandic scholar Grimur Johnson Thorkelin. And I know I got that wrong and I'm sorry. And it was subtitled A Danish Poem in the Anglo-Saxon Dialect. Now this is fascinating because he originally came across the Beowulf manuscript while he was working for the Danish government. They had him searching for, quote, manuscripts relevant to the history of Denmark. So at this time, the manuscript had been acknowledged and cataloged and some of it had been translated, but it wasn't until this first publication in 1815 that the world really started to see it and notice it. And my dudes, it was a really big deal. Interestingly enough, audiences in the 1800s went absolutely crazy for Beowulf. It very quickly became excruciatingly important, especially after the first full modern English translation of Beowulf, which was published in 1833 by scholar John Mitchell Kemble. Now listen. This poem that is distinctly Scandinavian and does not once mention England or an English event became the very foundation upon which Old English literature was formed. We talked a teeny bit earlier about the concept of owning quote unquote Beowulf and how the story has been claimed by many different countries and peoples. Well, this pretty much started right away in the 1800s and honestly, it makes sense because the 1800s were a very rocky time, pretty much everywhere. Nations were changing drastically, culturally and politically and upheaval was felt everywhere. Think industrial revolution, guys. There was a lot happening and not all of it was pleasant. In fact, most of it wasn't pleasant. So at this time, when it finally saw the light of day, many may have turned to Beowulf because they needed to look, quote, to the past for a landmark by which to map the unfamiliar territory of the present or for a dramatic alternative to the ugliest aspects of industrial society. Because the thing is, when we are faced with very intense change in the present, there is this thing that happens where society starts looking to the past for a kind of anchor. And as fate would have it, Beowulf was that anchor for many different nations in the 19th century. Thus, Icelandic scholar Thorkelin and all the subsequent translations very quickly revealed just how relevant a once anonymous, obscure Anglo-Saxon poem could be to a modern audience. A heroic epic is made even more vibrant to a society that can claim it as their own in this in a trying time like that. A historian by the name of Joshua Davies has claimed that history can be understood, quote, as a form of property, something that might be owned, something that secures privilege and status. Applying this thought to the ownership of Beowulf, Davies talks about the, quote, claims and counterclaims of ownership and says, quote, all litigants agreed that whomever the poem might belong to, it revealed important properties of their identity. So since Beowulf was written in the Anglo-Saxon dialect by Anglo-Saxon scholars for an Anglo-Saxon audience, the Anglo-Saxons have a very strong claim to this poem. But if you dig just a, just a teeny bit deeper here, you realize something. Back in the 1800s, this isn't what you realize, but back in the 1800s, antiquarians were stressing the kinship between Anglo-Saxons and Scandinavians. That's what you need to realize. And modern Anglo-Saxon scholars have also pointed this out, that while the poem is supporting evidence in a history of Anglo-Saxon England, there is actually just a huge circle going on here. Because if Beowulf is, in fact, English or Anglo-Saxon, then it is also Germanic or Scandinavian because the Anglo-Saxons were also Germanic and Scandinavian. Are we, are we coming to, yeah, are we getting it? Thank you. So really, we have this very large group of nations and peoples fighting over Beowulf and claiming it as their own, when really, they're kind of all right. So that's why it's so beautiful that Beowulf is written in Old English, a language that was created by the mixing of Germanic peoples. Because if you want to bring it right down to it, of to Beowulf being some kind of property, okay? 
anybody with a heritage of the English language or a heritage of Germanic tribes and cultures can claim this story as their own, whether that be through Anglo-Saxon peoples or Scandinavian ones. One source that I, that I found says that, quote, owning Beowulf has long given one the capability to establish both identity and status. Me, everyone, I'm the source. <laughs> I did, in fact, dig out one of my um, papers from grad school and use it. I am the source. Anyway, let me repeat it. Owning Beowulf has long given one the capability to establish both identity and status. And not only was this true when Beowulf resurfaced in the 1800s, but it was also true in the 11th century when this poem was finally written down and had been performed for centuries already, okay? Because with themes like loyalty and betrayal and invasion and defense, Beowulf would have spoken very, very clearly to a number of pressing concerns for audiences at the time. Audiences both then and more recently have found a lot in Beowulf that they can relate to, that they can really connect deeply with. Beowulf was and still is a key player in nationalist thinking and in the search for collective identity. To this day, reading Beowulf is at least somewhat, and I would argue quite a bit more than somewhat, a kind of nationalist experience for many scholars or just regular people who can identify in some way with the culture that it glorifies. We've never settled upon any one rightful claimant of this story because, in my opinion, there just really isn't one. It still remains alive in the hearts and imaginations of people who read it and find resonation within the emotions of the poem. And it's just so beautiful. I, I I'm stuttering because I'm having a lot of feelings and there's a lot, but it just, it remains alive in our hearts and in imaginations because I think we can we can find something to relate to. And especially if it's part of your linguistic heritage, you have the right to claim it. And one source that I said, that I found says that the reason that we can really connect to this is because somehow we relate, quote, to the cinders of a once splendid hall and the shadows of a once proud people. So at this point in our episode, we have talked about a lot of things. I know this episode is very, very heavy on the information load. Different from other episodes, and maybe it's like this amount of specific information I'm giving you. I don't know. I understand that information-wise, this episode feels really heavy. I did try to warn you about that, but it's okay. We're all here, and it's great. So... In the last little bit, we've talked about the Beowulf manuscript and the impact that it made once the words saw the light of day. But something you probably did not know is that these words almost didn't see the light of day. And that was semi-recently in the history of the manuscript, which brings us to Sir Robert Cotton. You may remember that I mentioned him very briefly earlier He was the one who had the Noel Codex in his possession when it was cataloged in 1705. And we need to dive a little bit deeper into this section of the story because it is very important and and honestly, it's quite insane. So let me give you the briefest explanation possible to get this rolling, okay? In the 1500s, when King Henry VIII decided to divorce his first wife and create a whole new church, this involved a process called the dissolution of the monasteries, which was essentially just him getting rid of all of the monks and all the monasteries and everything Catholic. When this happened, the vast libraries and documents that the monasteries had held forever began to be distributed among various owners, and many of them did not understand their cultural value. Basically, they didn't necessarily want to lose all the contents of these libraries, so they were just kind of handing out texts to various collectors and people who were not really trained in any way to understand them or to take care of them, but at least they wouldn't be destroyed. Sir Robert Cotton was different from all of these people because he was a scholar, an antiquarian, and a bibliophile. He, okay, so Sir Robert lived from 1571 to 1631. 
He was also a politician. And in the course of his life and his career, he collected and bound over 100 volumes of official papers. So because he actually had the skill set and the resources to find these important documents and purchase them, he was able to preserve them. And he created this wonderful library. Okay, He also went to law school. He studied under various antiquarians and classic scholars. So this guy is not just some rich dude with a hobby, as is often the case in things like this. Fun fact, he was actually rewarded his knighthood in 1603 for a work that he wrote supporting King James VI of Scotland as the successor of Elizabeth I, Elizabeth I on the British throne, which is pretty neat. So we know that he had started this process of collecting and preserving manuscripts as early as the age of 17. And in no time at all, his personal library began to rival and then surpassed the other great collections in England, like the Royal Library, for example. So Sir Robert's collection is important for many, many reasons. Really, we should do a whole episode on him and his library, shocker. But one of the reasons that his library was and is so important is because it had the only existing copy of several works, not just Beowulf. He also had the only existing copy of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So like, thank you so much, my dude. He also had the Lindisfarne Gospels, which we do not have time to talk about, but OMG, look it up. So by the year 1622, Sir Robert's house and library stood immediately north of the Houses of Parliament, and it was a hugely valuable meeting place. Leading scholars of the era, including Francis Bacon and Sir Walter Raleigh, all came to use Sir Robert's library, which is totally crazy, right? So, in, and as well as these scholars and various other antiquarians, Sir Robert's library was also used by a bunch of politicians and jurists of various political persuasions. So it was like the place to be. I would have loved to go there awesome. Where do I sign? It was a place full of very valuable knowledge in a very convenient location, and people were definitely taking advantage of that, as they very well should have been doing. I'm very glad that they were. I can only imagine what this library was like in its heyday. It would have been incredible. And Sir Robert understood how important this library was to the public, and he actually made it freely available to consult. And while lots of people were being awesome and taking advantage of this access to so much knowledge, this library and the knowledge it contained also caught the attention of some people who were a little bit higher up in the country, as in the king. So at this time, the politics of the country were pretty hardcore, for lack of a better term, when it came to parliament's power versus the king's power. So the king's ministers... I guess I shouldn't have said the king earlier because it was technically his ministers. But anyway, the king's ministers began to fear how much use was being made of Sir Cotton's library, worrying that it was contributing to pro-parliamentary and thus anti-king arguments. And okay, listen, maybe it was or it wasn't, but like, chill out, okay? Good grief. We talked about this last week in the Library of Alexandria, my friends. There is no political power without power over the archive. Okay, here we are. This is an example. Thank you. Anyway, anyway, so, but they, the ministers did not chill out, as you can probably imagine. So on November 3rd, 1629, our friend Sir Robert Cotton was arrested for the distribution of pamphlets that were said to be treasonous. Now, the best part about all of this is that he didn't even write this pamphlet. It was actually written 15 years earlier by Sir Robert Dudley. And no, your ears do not deceive you, Sir Robert Dudley. However, this was the Sir Robert Dudley who was the illegitimate son of the Robert Dudley that you're thinking of, just so you know. Anyway, even though Sir Robert Cotton didn't write this allegedly treasonous pamphlet, His library was closed by the government. I think it was just an excuse that they were looking for, honestly. He was released 12 days later on November 15th since he didn't do anything wrong. And prosecution on this case was actually abandoned the following May. However, 
the library still remained closed until his death a few years later, which is wildly tragic. Honestly, I, that is just so sad, but there is a little bit of a silver lining. I, I mean, silver lining is not the right term. There is some happiness because the library and the collection it housed were restored to Sir Robert's son and heir, Sir Thomas Cotton, in 1633. So Sir Robert's library included a lot of things. It was a collection of books, manuscripts, coins, and medallions. It was both maintained and added to by his son Thomas and his grandson, Sir John Cotton. So not only did it finally get reopened and, you know, restored to his family, but they continued to maintain it, maintain the works in it, and to add to it, which is beautiful. In 1702, this grandson, Sir John, passed away, and he donated the Cotton Library to Great Britain in his will, which was very big of him, to be honest. At this time, Great Britain didn't have a national library, and so this transfer of ownership of the Cotton Library became the basis of what is now the British Library. And yes, you may now allow your brain to explode. Go ahead. So this was in, that was in 1702. In 1706, the British Museum Act was passed and this act did a few things. First of all, it established the British Museum. Secondly, it allowed the trustees of the Cotton Library to move the Cotton Library collection from the Cotton House, which by that time was ruinous and falling apart. And the site of the Cotton House is now, um, is today covered by the Houses of Parliament. So they moved the library's collection to um, Essex House in London, but that didn't last long because this place was regarded as a huge fire risk. So it had to be moved again, and it was finally transferred to Ashburnham House in London. From the year 1707, Ashburnham House was the location of the Cotton Library, as well as the old Royal Library which was a collection of about 2,000 manuscripts that had been collected by various sovereigns of England over the years. What I wouldn't give to have access to that collection, like holy moly. Anyway, not only was Ashburnham House um, the place where all of these priceless manuscripts were kept, these two great collections, but it was also the residence of the Keeper of the King's Libraries. And I cannot stress, and like, how do I get this job? Keeper of the King's Libraries? How do I get this job? Who do I have to kill? Like, what do I have to do? Tell me. I want to know. I want this job. So badly I want this job. I don't even know if this job still exists. I might have to go back in time. Anyway, Keeper of the King's Libraries. At this time, that was a man named Richard Bentley, and he was a renowned theologian and the theolo theologian? that's better, theologian and classical scholar. Oh my gosh, guys, I am hysterical. The next line in my notes says, but your leg, oh no, it's caught in a bear trap. <laughs> which, ba <laughs> which basically is just me saying, um, things are about to get hairy. So what happened next was that on October 23rd, 1731, a fire broke out at Ashburnham House. And yes, feel free to weep at the very sad irony that that is because the whole reason the collections were there in the first place was because the first building had been considered a fire hazard. So that's great. Many, many manuscripts were lost in the Ashburnham House fire, at least 25% of the cotton collection alone, which is heartbreaking, and at least 200 of them faced severe damage from the fire as well as water damage. Um, they, I mean, they survived, but there was severe damage. So Richard Bentley, our keeper of the King's Libraries, he somehow escaped the fire unharmed, but he was holding an absolutely priceless um, manuscript called the Codex Alexandrinus, which is a manuscript of a Greek Bible written on parchment. I love it that that's what he chose to save, but like, I also get it. If you're in a, a library like that and it starts burning down, what do you grab? I'm pausing because that's a really big question. What do you grab? Let me know what you would grab. I wanna know. Um, it's just, anyway, okay, so 
this horrible fire happens. What now? So not all of the manuscripts were lost, which is a miracle. Somehow the fire was able to be stopped. But again, a lot of manuscripts faced a lot of damage. So a man by the name of Arthur Onslow, he was the Speaker of the House of Commons, and he was one of the statutory trustees of the library. He decided to direct and personally supervise this program of restoration. Now, this is insane because for like so many reasons, I don't even know if I can get into how crazy that is. But again, a lot of the manuscripts had been damaged, but we're in the 1700s. So restoration is pretty limited at this time. However, Arthur Onslow was very proactive about this and he did everything he could to establish a really great program for restoration within the resources that they had. And they published a report of this work, which is majorly important now because now we kind of know what manuscripts there were. So that's really exciting. And copies of some of the lost works had been made, but many of those that were damaged, you know, there's a lot here, but some of them could not be restored until the 19th century. So about a hundred years later, um, which is very sad. But today, advances in multispectral photography, guys, the modern world is pretty cool sometimes, okay? There's this thing called multispectral photography that has advances in it that are such that imaging specialists at the British Library can scan and upload images of previously illegible early English manuscripts that were damaged in this fire and it helps us to be able to decipher them. And all of this project is led by a woman named Christina Duffy. And this whole project will form part of a collection of something called the Fragmentarium. And the Fragmentarium will be a digital research laboratory for medieval manuscript fragments. It is an international collaboration of libraries and research institutions to catalog and collate vulnerable manuscript fragments, making them available for research. My dudes, I cannot stress enough how utterly wonderful this is. I am beside myself at how cool this is. Do you have any... <laughs> I'm like getting monotone because I like have so many feelings. I like might need to shut them off. Do you have any idea how incredible this is? I hope you do. This is amazing that we have the kind of technology to do this and to preserve these manuscripts in this way. It's so incredible and I'm here for it so hard. But anyway, let's get back to our story. So in 1753, 20 years after the fire, the Cotton Library was transferred to the new British Museum under the Act of Parliament that had established the British Museum. So at the same time, the Sloan Collection and the Harley Collection were acquired and added to it so that all three of these collections formed the museum's, quote, foundation collections. And the royal manuscripts were also there. They had been donated by George II in 1757. In 1973, all of these collections passed from the British Museum to the newly established British Library, which to this day still continues to organize the books and the manuscripts from the Cotton Collection according to the original classification, classification sorry, system that Sir Robert Cotton used, which is the most incredible thing I've ever heard. So I'm going to tell you. For example, our very dear friend, the Noel Codex, is classified in the British Library as British Library Cotton Vitellius A.15, meaning that when the Noel Codex was housed in obscurity in the original Cotton Library, it was the 15th book from the left on shelf A, which is the top shelf, of the bookcase with the bust of Roman Emperor Vitellius standing on top of it. And that, my friends, is what I call a classification system. So today, my friends, we are beyond lucky to still have the Noel Codex and to still have the one and only existing original copy of Beowulf. Because who knows, honestly, everywhere this manuscript has been and everything that it has seen, it's truly a miracle 
that it made it into the hands of Sir Robert Cotton, honestly. And then it's even more of a miracle that it survived the Ashburnham House fire in 1731. The manuscript was damaged in this fire. The margins were heavily charred, and today some of the writing on the outer edges is lost to us. But it's fine because um, I would rather take that over losing the whole manuscript. And we do still know what those words were because that damage wasn't irreparable until later. Um, and the manuscript was transcribed. So we do know what all of the words were. It's just that our original manuscript suffered a teeny bit. But again, we do know what all those words were. They're not lost to us. And overall, we still have the whole manuscript, which is, again, just such a miracle. It's so incredible that this manuscript survived to our time. And now it's incredible that we have countless translations and editions of it so that we don't have to worry about it being lost unless something truly crazy happens. But that's a story for another time, probably. And I find it not only just like so beautiful, but also incredibly fitting that this marvelous collection, this cotton collection that the Noel Codex was a part of, is now one of the foundational collections of the phenomenal British Library. I could spend an hour talking about that alone. That is so amazing. And I just, I'm, I'm so grateful and I think it's so incredible. So my friends, I now have some news. We are at the end of our episode and I just want to say thank you very, very much just in general, but also if you're still here with me. I'm aware that this episode was a lot of things, but mostly just me kind of trying to like shove my entire degrees into your brain in a very short amount of time. But that's because, like I said at the very top of the episode, this is something that I am very, very passionate about, as I'm sure you could tell listening to it. So truly, truly, Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being here and for listening to all this and for learning with me. In a strange way, it was actually a very vulnerable and nerve-wracking thing to share all of this with you because it means so much to me and because I feel like it holds this place in my heart and there are these ways that I think about it and understand it that I don't know how to truly convey. So I hope you enjoyed it. I really do. And... Here's another fact, guys. I really don't know how it happened, but my initial notes for this episode were about 13 pages long. And then when I went to like write the episode outline, like flesh it out more, we're now touching 30 pages. I have no idea how I did that. And here's the thing. I was actually a little bit worried that this would be a super short episode. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think I forgot who I was for a minute, but but that's okay. So this is the part of the episode where I would usually do my very best to just like quickly summarize and recap what we've learned, what I hope you've taken from our topic. And, but I actually can't do that in this episode. I really, really want to, but I can't. And because there's just too much in it that is really close to my heart. So really, I can only hope that you felt and understood my passion for all of this throughout the entire episode. And I hope that you've taken many, many things from this episode. Truly. I would like to officially end this episode by further keeping my promise of sharing some old English with you. So right now I will say thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out with me today. You can follow me on Instagram at notstrictlyhistory underscore podcast. You can send me an email at notstrictlyhistory at gmail.com if you want to be a part of the conversation, request an episode, anything like that. I have also enabled listener support on my podcast. If you're feeling like you want to support or donate or anything, that would be crazy wonderful, but that is available for you to do. That will be in the description box and also um, on like the what am I trying to say? Like the profile of my podcast. Anyway, thank you everybody for being here with me today. Um, I look forward to our next episode and um, I'd love to hear from you. So let me know how you felt about things today and, and all of that. And without further ado, here are some of my favorite lines from Beowulf. 
Linda Bende, Nege Leaf Neswald, Good Fremendra, Gerwe Newison, Maga Gemedu, Nefri, Ek Amaran Giesia, Eola, Ofa, Eodon Thona Is Erwesum, Sejon Sierwum, Nestat Seldguma, Webnum Geoeodad, Nefni him his Wilita Leoga, Anlek Ansen, Nu Ek Eowa Scale. See you next time, everyone.